Hello everyone, welcome to our discussion on the Heartbleed Bug, uh, which will be presented by Tommy, Marcus, David, and myself, Riley. Uh, we'll be starting with information on the Heartbleed Bug and how features of SSL allowed for such a serious vulnerability to occur and the kind of data that can be leaked. You've probably heard about a large variety of vulnerabilities that have come out in the past, and sometimes they're linked with major headline attacks. We will be bringing you back to April the 8th, 2014, just one day after the vulnerability was made public, it was used against the CRA. We will then be going into the technical details of how it works and why the bug exists. Lastly, we will be following this up with a live demonstration of the attack from start to finish against a web server in a virtual environment. Now on to Marcus. Thank you, Riley. So first began in 2014, the Heartbleed blog officially given the vulnerability identifier CVE-2014-0160 the very strong vulnerability that was found in the OpenSSL cryptographic software library. This weakness allows the attackers to steal voluble, valuable and private information from the user without leaving any traces. Reveals, it reveals the adjacent memory to the request due to buffer overread, dumps any memory after the request location, and pull information like passwords and other sensitive material, and if the attacker is fortunate enough, can stumble upon it. Some information can include secret keys for usernames, passwords, instant messages, emails, and business documents. Again, due to the herb bleed being found in OpenSSL, the chance of any company or individual being vulnerable is high. OpenSSL is used to protect email servers and chat servers, even VPNs. Research has found that almost 600,000 servers, which is roughly 17% of all SSL servers, were vulnerable. The Heartbleed bug can reveal the contents of a server's memory where most users' sensitive material is stored. Therefore, any attacker using the Heartbleed blood bug can gain access to leaked information. All the leaked information is separated into three different categories. Primary key material. These are, these are the keys that the attacker can use to decrypt any past, present, and future information and impersonate any sort of services. Secondary key material. These are the user credentials such as usernames, passwords that can be used to get into services and servers. And lastly, protected content, which is anything that needs to be protected by encryption that can be seen such as personal and financial details, emails, messages, and documents. Next is David going to be talking about which companies and organizations were affected. Thank you. So just who exactly was impacted by the Heartbleed bug? As you can already tell, the Heartbleed bug has the capability to penetrate any individual system carrying the initial version of OpenSSL. Mega organizations such as Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Netflix, and many, many more were affected by the Heartbleed bug. And as mentioned earlier, the bug could reveal personal information such as bank accounts, house addresses, and even government records. The latter, unfortunately, was a huge crisis for Canada, specifically the CRA, the Canadian Revenue Agency. In 2014, 19-year-old Western University student in the person of Stephen Solis Reyes used the Heartbleed bug to exploit the CRA servers. According to the court hearing he had to attend, Solis Reyes had access to CRA records within six seconds, revealing 900 social insurance numbers. This created an immediate shutdown of the CRA system, and Solis Reyes was charged with two counts of mischief, an unauthorized use of a computer, and obstructing a police officer. It goes without saying, the Heartbleed bug can endanger the most guarded of systems. On to you, Tommy. Thank you, David. So, how does the Heartbleed bug even work? As the bug is an implementation error in TLS, which is Transport Layer Security Protocol, any version of OpenSSL without the fix, versions 1.0.1 .1 to 1.0.f specifically, are vulnerable. The Heartbleed bug was actually a malicious usage of the RFC 6520 Heartbeat extension, RFC being the request for comments publication who initially proposed the extension. Essentially, the extension is intended to test secure links of TLS or DTLS, DTLS standing for Datagram Transport Layer Security, and it tested that format by sending a heartbeat request. This heartbeat request, like as you can see on the screen right over here, uh, consisted of a payload such as a string of text and the 16-bit integer of the length of the payload allocated in a memory buff. Now, a computer or server will receive this request and is asked to return a value that matches the payload with the same length of the buffer. However, the OpenSSL versions that were affected by the bug actually did not validate the size of the memory buffer, as in it didn't check if the memory buffer length was the same size as the length of the payload. This right here is actually the fundamental problem of the Heartbleed. 
an attacker can send a distorted version of a standard heartbeat request. What this means is actually that it sends a small payload and a massive length field to a vulnerable device, which in most cases was actually a server. Uh, the request will prompt the device to send back uh, the payload. However, since the length of the buffer isn't satisfied by the payload alone, once again, because the length of the field was far too long, uh, the memory that was used by OpenSSL uh, adjacent to the request is actually uh, sent along with it, a slew of it actually. So the payload will go back plus a large amount of memory. A general output of a heartbleed attack such as this uh, will have a string of something like what's shown on the screen. If the payload was called payload, it'd be payload plus additional memory such like usernames, passwords, IP addresses, and more. Now, essentially, an attacker can read up to 64 kilobytes of memory. That's quite a bit, actually, because it's, uh, it can be any sensitive information. But that memory is always adjacent to the request. Since Heartbleed works this way, uh, it's technically random memory because you can't choose where the request location is. But the attacker can gain sensitive information from devices especially servers. Since TLS sometimes will exchange the, between parties, sometimes without encrypting the exchange, uh, some information such as passwords, usernames, requests, master keys, private keys, and other information can be stumbled upon if the victim's unfortunate enough. With just some of this information, the attacker can have access to material that is normally authenticated, which compromises the confidentiality of the affected. So, why does the Heartbleed bug even exist though? To understand how it even happened in the first place, we need to understand how the Heartbeat extension works. It was an extension proposed for TLS and DTLS by the RFC publication in 2012. A year earlier, Robin Segelman, who was actually for the RFC, had implemented the Heartbeat extension into OpenSSL, and he actually got it reviewed by Stephen Henson, who was one of the four main developers of OpenSSL. However, at the time, Henson had actually missed the bug when reviewing the extension allowing the bug to be released on the actual live version of OpenSSL, version 1.0.1, .1, in March 2012. Since the Heartbeat extension was enabled by default, anyone with that version of OpenSSL that upgraded to it was vulnerable to the bug. Now, the Heartbeat bug, Heartbleed bug was eventually actually discovered by Neil Mehta of Google Security, who discovered the exploit on the 1st of April 2014. He reported it to the OpenSSL team as soon as he found out about it. Another group actually discovered it two days later, Codenomicon, on April the 3rd, uh, uh, 2014, and reported it to the NCSC FI. Now, realize that both of these reports were very close to each other in the time span. Like, they were only two days apart, but both of them only appeared two years after the initial implementation of the bug. So, from here, the actual official reference for Heartbleed became CVE 2014-0160 and the bug was fixed in version 1.0.1g. Anyone who remained on OpenSSL versions 1.0.1f were still susceptible to being attacked unless they upgraded to at least 1.0.1g. Now, I'm going to hand off the mic to Riley again, who will demonstrate a heartbleed attack against a web server. Thank you, Tommy. So now I'm going to go ahead with my demonstration. Alrighty, so in this demonstration, uh, what we are going to be doing is I'm going to be using our vulnerable web server, which is an Ubuntu server, and I'm going to be using Kali, which is going to be running Metasploit. On our vulnerable web server, we do need to have a copy of OpenSSL running that is exploitable. Uh, in this case here, it's OpenSSL 1.0.1, and we determine that by typing in the command OpenSSL version A. The next step we need to have is we obviously need to have a copy of Apache running an HTTPS server so that we can get our web page sent to us. Uh, in this case here, we've taken a basic uh, web submission form from the internet. It's going to post to our server. And in that post, it's uh, going to send both a username and a password. Now, in this first demonstration, you'll notice that I am in HTTP mode because I'm going to be showing you through Wireshark what we see. And then I'm going to be showing you what we don't see when it's in secure mode. And then afterwards, we're going to be going through the uh, exploit. So then you can sort of see this information that's being captured in the uh, Heartbleed bug. So inside of our Wireshark, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start it off screen. So let's pull this over here. and We're going to have this running. 
and we're going to go ahead and refresh the page. So what's happening right now is it's pulling on a get request and our username we're going to use is test get user and our password we are going to use is just password get and I'm going to go ahead and hit login. So what's going to happen now is it's going to post to our server and it's going to display our new page. So let's go ahead and stop this now. And if we look through our capture in Wireshark, we can actually see we have our get request that's coming from our web browser. So it's coming from our host machine, which happens to be 192.168.168.1. And it's going to our destination 192.168.168.143, which is our vulnerable web server. So we have this get request that's happening. And if we look inside of the get request, we can see all the information about our HTTP and we can see our response that's coming back. So if we go through here, we look for this HTTP OK response and we can scroll through it to the very bottom. And right there, you can see inside of its data portion, the uh, CSS that's being sent, the style sheet, as well as the actual body of the form. If we continue scrolling down, we can find our post request. So we're posting to our server and we're going to post to the supersecret.html. And we can see here information in our post, our user agent. We can see the refer as 192.168.168.143, which was the previous web page we were on. And if we scroll down, we can see our form items. Username, we got test get user. And password, we got password get. Now, this isn't going to actually have any purpose for our um, for our demonstration, uh, because right now we're in HTTP mode. There's no reason we need to have a heart bleed because it's already clear text. However, what we are going to do is we're going to go back to that main page. Instead, we are going to be in secure mode. So I'm going to go ahead and start the capture again. And we're going to go ahead and enter in test post user. And I'm going to enter in a password. You're not going to know what the password is. And we're going to go ahead and hit the login button. Same thing as before. We have test post user, a password that you don't know. And if we look through here, we can see our TLS uh, packages, the exchange that's happening from the client. And we can see our little hello packets and our encryption. So as you can see, we can't see anything of value. So we're going to go ahead and shut the Wireshark off and we're going to kick it off the screen. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this off the screen temporarily because we may end up needing to use it a second time. So we have our open SSL running. We have our web server. We now know this sort of get post process. What we need to do is we need to start from the perspective of an attacker. So an attacker that's coming onto your network may not necessarily know everything about the servers. So what they may end up doing is they might run something like an end map. So they could do an end map of the network, which is 192.168.168.0 and it's a slash 24 network. So we're going to go ahead and run that nmap scan. It takes a little bit of time because what it's doing is it's going across the entire network. It's going to find open hosts and then it's going to do a port scan of the most common ports. So we look through these, uh, this, these bits of information and we can see we have some choices in life. Uh, we go through here, we end up seeing, as an example, we have port 443 and while we may not necessarily know immediately through some you know, analysis prior, we probably have an, a good understanding that the server is hosted on 192.168.168.143. So now we have that available to us. So the next thing we can do is we can go ahead and we can do an nmap and we can do specifically a check against this using the port 443, using the script ssl-heartlead 192.168.168.143. And we're going to go ahead and run that. And we can see that currently it's in a vulnerable state. It's letting us know the high risk factor and it's telling us what we need to do to correct the have corrective action. So what we're going to perform now is we're actually going to perform an attack against this system and hopefully be able to capture some information that's going to, you know, reveal some uh, secrets. So what we're going to go, go and do first is we're going to go ahead and uh, open up our Metasploit. So we can go ahead and type in the command msf console, launching our Metasploit. Takes a few seconds for the framework to start up, and there it is. 
and we're going to go ahead and search for our package. Now, we're going to do a search for Heartbleed, and we're going to look through here, and specifically, uh, what we're looking for is the scanner, so that's the last one there. So we can go ahead and tell it that we're going to use Auxiliary, Scanner, SSL, Open SSL, Heartbleed. So now that we have that package uh, marked as in use, we can display some information about it. So we can do our show options. And from show options, we can see things that can be configured. All sorts of information by default, everything's configured except for our hosts. That's the only thing that you need to have configured. If it was on a different port as an example, or you wanna change your amount of tries, we can do all that sort of stuff from here. Uh, but what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go ahead and set our, our host. So we're gonna do our set our hosts to 192.168.168.143, which was the address that we found through our nmap scan. And then from here, we're then gonna go ahead and set our verbose level. Or turn on verbosity rather, sorry. So verbosity is now turned on and we can go back quickly and do our little show here. And we can see now our, our host, our remote host that we're gonna be exploiting is now marked. And we can go ahead and now perform the exploit. So we can type in the command exploit and it spits off some information. Now you might say, oh, that's just fantastic. There's nothing really of use here, which is true. There's not always gonna be something of use as mentioned prior. Uh, sometimes you gotta search through it a little bit. So scrolling up slowly, we're gonna look for things that may possibly be of importance. So going through it, and it, like I said, it's not always a guarantee we're gonna get something. So it actually turned out we got a good result here. So right at the top, what does this look like? It looks like that post header, right? That we saw in the unencrypted fashion. So we see here, we have our uh, platform. We see windows, uh, we can see user agent. We can see all the information that we saw in that post header. But more importantly, look at these last two fields we see here. Uh, we have our username, test post user, and our password, post password, with two O's and a number one sign. So we can see there, this information has just literally been spilled out for us. More importantly, if you actually look, we actually have a little bit of the host name here, the, uh, or the, the host name itself, Ubuntu-Heartbleeds. That's the host name of our vulnerable server. Now, maybe this doesn't happen the first shot. Maybe we do the scan and nothing actually comes of it. Well, what we can do is we can actually uh, spool this into a file. So we can use the command spool. If you're not sure of the syntax, just simply typing it in, we can see what we got to work with. So we're gonna go ahead and create our temp file, so TMP. And then we're going to call this demo exploit.txt. And it's going to spool now the output into that file. Now, something else I want to change a little bit of, pretending that maybe we didn't get our information on that first shot. When we go back to show options, uh, there's actually one thing that we can perform, which is our leak count. Right now, it's set to one. So instead, we can do a set count of leak to, say, 100. So showing options now, now it's gonna perform this attack 100 times. So it's gonna perform 100 requests. So hypothetically, we should be getting back, you know, 100 times 64 kilobytes worth of memory. May be useful, may not be useful, who really knows? So what we can do now is we can go ahead and run our exploit, simply typing in the command exploit. So we can see these requests now being sent off. We're gonna see our responses happening. And, you know, maybe we got good stuff, maybe we don't have good stuff. We don't really know. But now that it's put into a text file, we can then perform some, you know, basic uh, parsing action. Now, as an example, uh, we're just going to use the grep command. And inside of here, we called it demosploit. Demosploit.txt. And let's make this a little bit bigger. Rerun it again. So what we've searched for is the word password. So going up, we can actually see we have some different results here. They're gonna be highlighted in red. And if you were to write a more advanced algorithm or you know search function, we could find different things. So we can see all sorts of different tests. We can see test five in there. We see test five. Going up a little farther, we see our post test. We see another test five in there. 
We see another test five, post test. So this is what I was talking about before, where this stuff that basically gets spit out, it's all sorts of bits of information, and there's no guarantee you're necessarily going to get what you're looking for. Test five, test five, post test five. So as we go through here, that's all we're looking for. We're just going through, we're just checking for information. And it looks like those are actually the two that are probably going to be the only ones that keep showing up over and over and over again, based on where the memory is that we're getting. Post pass, test five. Oh, there's another one, fast user pass, which was actually a demo that we ran earlier on. There it is, fast user pass. So as you can see, I'm not doing it the most efficient way of searching through here. Um, however, there we go, fast user pass. So we see three different sets of passwords, three different sets of usernames that are coming up in here. And as I mentioned before, we can see the user agent information. So little little tiny bits of information, and depending on how you know you search this data, will determine what you get out of the uh, the results. So that's for our demonstration. So now that you've seen this bug from start to finish and the high profile attack, we would like to leave you with the question. What could have been done differently at the time? Do you think the specifics of the information was released too soon publicly, or do you think it could have been acted upon quicker? It's always a precarious balancing act that you may one day end up needing to complete, and hopefully you make the right decision. Here are the references we used if you want to read about it, and these are some of the resources for replicating the testing environment that we performed this in. And thank you, everyone. Have a good day.